Well, everybody, here is the Steinberger. This is a Steinberger Synapse. It's a Gibson Steinberger. I guess there are other Steinbergers as well. Let me see if I can give you a shot of the whole thing, because that's part of the, the fun of it. It's a headless guitar. A minimal guitar. Probably the most famous user of this was of course, Eddie Van Halen in Summer Nights, the Van Halen or Van Hagar song, if you will, Summer Nights. And I believe he used it in that song because it had this unique property at the time in that the tremolo, not this tremolo, could change the key that you were playing in. He plays the opening in one key and then he switches. And the guitar sounds great in that uh, video. It's not the same as this guitar. This one is a Gibson, and it's not made. It's a Gibson Steinberger Synapse. Sorry, it's upside down. I'll turn it over. It's not made like you would make a boat out of carbon fiber in a mold. I guess the Newberg Steinbergers were made that way. This one appears to have been made in you know, Indonesia or maybe Korea out of maple, solid maple. The neck, I think it's a neck through neck rather than a set neck. And then it's been coated with a uh, hard plastic of some kind, probably some kind of catalyzed epoxy or, or I don't know, polycarbonate. And this particular guitar I bought online on eBay rather and it was kind of uh, was what you would call a factory third it uh, factory second would I guess be a guitar like Eddie bought his his one of his first electric guitars he bought he bought it as a factory second at Mighty Might which is a guitar that would have blemishes and uh, they wouldn't sell it for a full price they would sell it for uh, less money this is probably a factory third. I bought this as a husk or a shell. You can see this big crack here around the, the knob. There are other pieces of damage here too. And I think it was, here's, the, here's a cavity that I've actually put the original sales receipt in. I mean, if you look at this thing, you will see that the holes weren't even drilled right. Uh, maybe somebody, I think there's a pretty bad one right here. Where is it? Here. That hole especially, you can see, was drilled several times, and so there's four holes that are supposed to have two screws in them. So someone gave up on this, stripped all the parts off of it, scratched out the serial number, and, got, and it was sold eventually to me as a factory third or a fa complete factory reject. The only hardware this thing had on it when I got it were down here. It had two strap buttons, one here and one here. And you could actually, I think, string this guitar up so you could use it left-handed or right-handed, I guess was the idea of two strap buttons. So that's the way I bought it. The, uh, the bridge is kind of hilarious. It's, it's a Chinese version of a headless guitar bridge. And it says, Overlord of Music. There you can really see it. Overlord of Music. And I think that's kind of like a Chinese translation of King of Rock and Roll or uh, King of Pop. Michael Jackson liked to be called the King of Pop. We all know that Elvis was the King of Rock and Roll. This is the Overlord of Music. And I got this uh, number one, because I didn't have a, it didn't come with a bridge. And number two, I wanted a whammy bar. I wanted a a a, a trim that would dive bomb. And I think Steinberger synapses, the ones that are made by Gibson now, they don't come with it with a trim. It's a locked bridge, hardtail. But I wanted a, a a dive bomb, and this is set up so that it it uh, 
it bombs, it dives rather, and then it it comes back and pulls hard against the body. As and so it's a it's a dive only trim, which is like Eddie's guitar. I think the same thing. But this isn't a Floyd Rose, and I have the feeling it doesn't dive as well as a Floyd. I put a couple of flathead screws under it so that it would it would be a dive only trim, and then down here this locking nut which actually has two locking mechanisms it has these three clamps and then each string back here I will turn it over has I can show you oh there it is no, you can't hardly see it but right in here are set screws for there you can sort of see it from the reflection of my finger now you see the holes those are set screws this is a, uh, a nut with a th slotted thread on it that I made to adjust the uh, truss rod. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to adjust the truss rod. I'm going to replace, you can see there's a string here. The high, I broke the high E. I think the uh, neck needs to be adjusted. You can see I made this aluminum panel and this neck uh, holder to hold the strap uh, close to the fingerboard at the balance point rather than rather than down here uh, it's up here so the guitar balances better so anyway so here's me in 1981 with some electric guitars that I made I took a year off school and decided I was going to make electric guitars and so uh, that's me. And then this, where is it here? Here's Mike Kelsey. Mike Kelsey ran the music store that I worked at. I made electric guitars. I sold them at his store and he never asked me to pay rent. He never asked for a percentage of them. He was just a great guy. Mike Kelsey, Kelsey Music, Eugene, Oregon, right around 1980, 81. Uh, such a nice, person to uh, have done that for a guy for a almost a teenager who was just uh, learning trying to learn and the person that I learned from flip through these the person that I learned from was this man and that's Bruce Wright um, everybody called him Roscoe he's got a company called Wright Guitar and he makes guitars and he was uh, the guitar repair tech uh, technician and he and and Roscoe was so nice to show me all sorts of things about making guitars here he is here's another shot of him and he appears to be um, sanding and profiling the fretboard on a you know maybe it's a Gibson 335 345 355 something like that this is also circa 1980 oh and here he is here he is uh, uh, with a Martin in a belt sander. I'll turn it sideways so you can... No, that would be... There you go. He's got a Martin guitar and a belt sander. So I learned so much from, from Roscoe, and, and he, I believe he still has a place in Eugene. So Roscoe was so nice to show me things and help me, and even hire me to do some work I was such a beginner. I learned so much and I started to learn as I was leaving to go back to school. I started to learn some things from him about setting up a neck, the relief of a neck, how an electric guitar or any guitar neck is not actually straight, flat. It, it has relief built into it. It bows forward somewhat. And I never really understood what he was talking about or learned about it uh, until all these years later when I started to Go to my next source, which is the awesome Dave of Dave's World of Fun Stuff. This guy has a YouTube channel with hundreds of videos of him repairing guitars. And I watched him repair guitars, and I watched Roscoe repair guitars, and I was astounded how decades between the two viewings of these two people their techniques were so similar. To see Roscoe and Dave both reset the neck, remove the neck of a Gibson, or rather a, a Martin, 
steam it off, cut the heel, and uh, change the angle of the neck, and to see how amazingly close they were kind of surprised me. Now the last source of information that I'm going to use to work on the Steinberger today is from, yep, you guessed it, the Dan Erlewine Guide to a Guitar Repair. And uh, this is a great book. So much great information for so little money. Um, I can't recommend this book enough. And the funny thing about this is that this book, Dave, is uh, Dave is something of a of a curmudgeon. <laughs> so here's Dan here's Dan Erlewine, and then another's pic there was a picture or two of him in the book, but and here's Dave, and Dave has a great online video presence on YouTube, and every once in a while he he pulls out Dan Erlewine's book. This is available from Stuart McDonald. And Dave says, oh, I hate this book, and oh, it's no, and, but, but it surprised me how much watching Dave's techniques and reading about Dan's techniques and all the measurements and everything they do, it amazed me how all three of these wonderful gentlemen agree. And uh, you might think that's funny because if you watch Dave, you'll see him get mad and say, oh, this doesn't make, I don't like this and I don't like that. But um, Dave's a bit of a curmudgeon and uh, that's part of what's fun about watching him. And I've learned so much from Dave. Uh, started out with Roscoe, learned so much from Dave and so much from Dan. So anyway, these are the three sources that I'm gonna use when I work on this uh, Steinberger. I'm going to use the amazing Stuart McDonald string action gauge. I got this from Stu Mac and it has uh, all these scales on it. There's a 30 second scale, uh, there's a decimal scale in thousandths of an inch here and then the one that I like to use, I think they use the most is, um, let's see, where do I, here. I tuck the card in and I measure in 60 fourths of an inch right here and uh, it comes with a instruction sheet which is cool written I would assume by Dan Erlewine also so but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these factory specs he, here he, he, Dan compares the Gibson factory specs with his specs my specs Neck relief at 7th fret, factory 12 thousandths. He likes to use a 4 thousandths relief, which is much less. I believe Dave likes a 12 thousandths feeler gauge. Dan says 4. And in string heights, low E 564, high E 364. He does 364 on both of them. And I think... I could check, but I think Dave is, you know, 4, 464. He, he likes it a little higher. And, of course, it depends on how you play. I mean, if you're, if you're a player that really hits the strings hard, you might want a high action. I've also noticed that some players have a, they like a high action if they bend because then they, their, their finger can get into the string. If the strings are really low, they, they have a hard time getting in and bending. Um, I think the shredders... The guys that are playing metal, they like a really slow, low height, and they like to, to move really quickly. There's not as much bending going on. Uh, so, you know, all of these things are... I think this, this chart is sort of what makes... I think Dave doesn't like these specs. But, you know, everybody's got their own specs. So here's what I'm going to do. Feeler gauge. Feeler gauge. This is an automotive feeler gauge. It's a craftsman. It's really, I've used it for so many things over the years. Here's 9, 10. Okay, so there's 12 thousands. 12. I'm going to go 12. Like Dave always does. And then, let me get this string out of the way. This is kind of the reason this all started, is this high E string broke. 
So, let's see if I can get this off of here. Turns out it was about two and a half millimeters up here. I have the feeling this is not, this double clamp is bigger. All metric. This guy here. Okay. Like that. Quite an interesting bend on that one. Okay. That must be a 10. That's the 10. But these are 10s. I always thought I played 9s. Then I discovered that I have these awesome Diderios. And they're all 10s. I bought a bunch of them. Ah, it's still in there. The uh, ball end, the ring end, to get that out somehow. It is probably not steel. No, it won't come out with a magnet. Let's try some very small hemostats. These tips have been ground. I could have probably also turned the guitar over. Okay, this goes in here. Like this. Somehow. There it goes. Tighten it until it sort of gets covered up. Like there. And come out. And we gotta thread it through. I'm gonna cut some of the string off. <laughs> 